Okay. Oh, that's much nicer. That's better, isn't it? Much better. So we're going to start with a guided meditation just to calm things down. So if you can make sure your mobile phones are turned off. They can come, come in. And so the, <laughs> they won't make any noise. <coughs> and please sit down as comfortably as you can. It's nice that everybody's much closer. It's much better energy when people are close together. And I said in many of the auditoriums, this becomes the mosh pit. And you're all in the mosh pit today. There's much better energy. So let's get started with a guided meditation. It's only 6.34, it's only four minutes late. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so please sit down, close your eyes, close your mouth, and close your brain. So we can have some quiet time at the beginning of this evening session. And for quiet time, it's good to have a, quiet, uh, a comfortable body, first of all. As many of you have been listening to me before, I am sure that instead of just calling this mindfulness training, we add the extra, uh, the extra letter K to call it kindfulness. So first of all, please be kind to your body, which means you can feel it, you can know it. For example, how is your legs right now? How are your legs? How do they feel? Now, I usually sit cross-legged on the floor, but here, because it's being videoed live, I like to take my shoes off so I can feel the contact, contact with the soles of my feet and the floor. It's kind of like interesting for my sense of uh, comfort and well-being. And after a while, you get so aware of you know, the feelings in your feet, you can also learn how to relax them. It's a strange thing, but when I was experimenting with this many years ago, you also found you can relax even your toes. So just try this right now. How do your toes feel? Once you can start to perceive and pick up some feelings and sensations in your toes, then you have the, opp the opportunity to get feedback. You can feel how your toes are. And you can learn by trial and error how to relax them. To me, I never thought that possible. But now, after many years, you can look at your toes and relax each one of them. So they feel more comfortable than ever before. And I do the same with the rest of my feet, with the soles and the heels and the uppers, relaxing every part of the foot as much as I can, just by wishing it well. One thing which you learn from this is what kindness really means. If you give kindness to your feet, they do relax. They do feel more open, more at ease allow energies to go through them in the proper ways, to heal, reinvigorate. So you may have been walking a long distance, but then you can learn how to relax those feet and revive them. And it feels comfortable. There is a pleasure involved in relaxation. And it's not a pleasure to avoid, but a pleasure to be aware of. Because once you can feel the pleasure of a relaxed part of your body, it gets even more relaxed. So then you go up your ankles. How do your ankles feel right now? 
How do your lower legs feel? Your calf, the skin around the lower legs, the muscles inside, the blood vessels. You don't have to be specific, but just feel what's going on in your lower legs and give them this wonderful sense of, I care for you. <coughs> Even when I see an old friend and I smile, recognize, and I say, I care for you, people relax. They feel much more at ease. It's the same with parts of your body as well. When I pay attention to my lower legs and say how much I care for them, sincerely, those legs relax. I can feel it happening right in this moment. It's amazing just how this little exercise, you start with your feet and then your lower legs, how it can lead to a lot of physical health. And I go past my lower legs to my knees. I'm over 72 now. So my knees should be giving me problems, but they're always really in good order because I look after them. When I meditate, I check them out. How are you, knees? And I use kindfulness to relax everything I can in my knees. I can even feel right now, because I was walking you know, from the train station to get here, and then I can feel just in those knees some things, I'm not quite sure what they're called, they were tight a moment ago, and now they're loosening up, relaxing everything in that area of my body. And I like to linger there because it does actually change the feelings in my knees, and it gets really comfortable. And I do know if ever there was an accident, if I fell over or hit my knee, I know how to cure that how to relax it and let energy go to that part of the body until it heals so, so well and so quickly. But then I go past the knees to my thighs, which do a lot of work. And I make sure that everything in my th thighs is well, at peace, feels comfortable, it's not threatened, doesn't need to tense up. You know, sometimes if there is as I scan up through my thighs, any tension or tightness there, I imagine it expanding, loosening, letting go of any tightness, like loosening a belt around your waist. And as it expands and loosens, so that nothing is squashing it, stretching it, it starts to feel very comfortable and I'm relaxing my thighs right now, just my thighs. And then I go to my butt. My butt is on a chair. I wasn't paying much attention to it a few moments ago, but now I can feel it. And I know that if I just carry on sitting like this, it will get sore later. So what I do, I usually straighten my back up. This is just me, you find out what works for you. When I straighten my back up, even the, the butt feels much more comfortable. It still has feelings there, but those feelings will disappear after a few moments. And then I can feel the waist. And I usually just twist around a little bit, just to make it as comfortable as I possibly can. This is, again, mindfulness together with kindness. The two together make your body very, com very comfortable. And I spread that mindfulness and kindness up my back. Sometimes I do what I've seen kangaroos doing in my monastery over in Western Australia. They put their upper paws against a tree and they stretch. I haven't got a tree in front of me, but I can still stretch my back. And it feels really good. And when I've stretched it, then I let go. And it comes to a position of quite wonderful comfort. And then my shoulders. 
I scrunch them up as tight as I can, really scrunch them. It's, this is unnatural, I'm actually forcing this, but then I let go. When I let go, my shoulders relax to a position which are more comfortable than when I started. And it also, I love teaching this to you because it tells you an example of what letting go is. You take away the pressure, the force, the stretching and the squashing and the wanting and the striving, tear that all away so you can relax to the max. And my back and shoulders feel really relaxed. But I also like going uh, up the inside of my body as well. Go up my uh, digestive tract. I don't have any trouble with that today. You don't eat in the afternoon or evening as a monk. But I can just scan through. And if I see anything there which is a bit tight or aching, I pause. Imagine expanding it being kind to it. Imagine a imaginary un invisible hand just stroking that part of your body. I can't put my hand inside my body, but I can imagine it to be stroking and caring for a part of my body which is a bit sore. Today is, everything is really in good shape. But one of the reasons I teach this is because as you are scrolling your attention, scanning your attention up your body, sometimes people feel there's some kind of tension or something not quite right in the area of your body, by your chest, your breasts. Too many women, females, suffer from breast cancer. And I teach this over in the Cancer Support Association, now called Solaris, over in Perth. So that you can understand how your body feels in those areas. And learn through kindness how to relax so much that any inflammation in that area is reduced. And when the inflammation is reduced, one of the great causes of cancer is also alleviated. You feel much more healthy. I get to know my body and learn through kindness how to relax it in areas which a lot of people don't really know exists. And then I go up the top of my body to the throat, the neck. I usually move my head around to make sure it's so balanced on top of the neck, there's no tension there at all. <coughs> I make sure my arms and hands are in a good position. And then I go above the neck to my head. I like doing this because when I start to be aware of any tightness in my face, I realize sometimes that tightness in the muscles around the eyes, the nose or the mouth is due to emotional problems. Fear, anxiety, wanting. That's why you can read a person's mind a lot of times just by looking at their face and how it's configured. So I relax all those muscles around my eyes, my nose and my mouth really relax them until they feel so much at ease. And when they relax, many of the emotional problems vanish with them. I don't always do this, but I haven't done this yet on this, uh, this visit. Then I imagine, imagine my brain I imagine my brain inside my skull has been overworked, doing too much, talking too much, deciding too much. And I just imagine that my skull has a hinge on one side, like a little box, so I can open it up. So I open up my skull 
just imagination, and I take out my poor overworked brain. I take it out and put it into this lovely little cushioned uh, little box, nice and warm and safe and soft. And I put it and say, take a rest, brain. You need a rest as well. Just go to sleep. Be peaceful. The mind will look after everything. But the brain doesn't need to make any decisions, doesn't need to carry any burdens, doesn't need to aim for anything. This is not work time, this is rest time. I'll put you back again afterwards once the meditation is finished. Whatever I teach you, I do practice myself to make sure it works. And it does. And give my brain a break for 10 or 15 minutes. And then I, I got into the habit of being aware of the whole body at this point. And once again, it's, it surprises me. It's really, really relaxed. Can hardly feel any tightness or tension anywhere. And I wait, just being aware of a relaxed body. Because what I've always noticed, when the body relaxes, joy comes up. It's a certain type of pleasure. In Pali, I call it the Piti Sukha, which arises when the body is really at peace. And I notice that when I focus on that joy of relaxation, the body becomes more relaxed. I'm more at ease, more healthy. Sometimes I like indulging in that because it's physically good for me. But then there comes a time when we take the meditation deeper once your body is at ease, then is the opportunity for coming into the mind. Throughout this whole body scan, you've been in the present moment, because feelings in the body only exist now. You may have some memories of aches and pains and joy, but mostly it's right here, right now. And if it's pleasant, it's easy to be here. You've got lots of present moment awareness already. The next thing which is important is to be silent. Don't give things names. Be at peace. You can know without having to figure everything out. This is not a test, you're not going to be examined or graded afterwards. Allow your mind to be still. You understand much more in silence than you can ever understand with words. Be still and silent. I will be quiet for a few moments. Just allow you to enjoy the stillness, the present moment, and the relaxed body and mind.
And there's no need to name anything or work out things. Most of the wonderful wisdom comes in silence, not through thinking. See how much you can relax into this silence, into this moment. What you are doing is just abandoning, stilling, calming the mind which wants things. Just be happy to be here, wanting for nothing in the whole world. And see how much peace that generates. Okay, how do you feel now? How much contentment is inside? So the meditation is about to end. So please open your eyes. Don't forget to put your brain back in place. And the meditation is just finished now. What time should we finish the talk? Half an hour, 40 minutes? Max 40 minutes. Sorry? 40 minutes. 40, okay, it's good. Excellent. So now the talk. And the talk is titled, I've forgotten now, it's Letting Go, isn't it? What is Letting Go? What, what is it? I know. <laughs> <laughs> what is Letting Go? You know, I had a, a friend who was a Buddhist and one thing about being a Buddhist is you're supposed to keep the five precepts. The five precepts is not killing anything, not stealing, not uh, committing adultery, not lying, not taking alcohol or drugs, non-medicinal ones. So he said he had a lot of difficulty, especially with that fifth precept and not drinking alcohol. But he said he was, he was certainly wanted to do it. But then what happened, he went to this uh, party at work. And at this party, somebody was going around serving alcohol. And he said, no, 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 I can't take any alcohol. I'm a Buddhist now. I can't take alcohol anymore. And the person serving the drink said, you're a Buddhist? Well done. Buddhism is a really good religion. It's all about letting go. Come on, let go and have a drink. <laughs> so, that didn't work. <laughs> but then he's, he came to see me later 
and said, I've finally found out how to do it. I don't tell people oh, I'm a Buddhist. Instead, what I do when there's some reception or, or function for the company in which I work, you still find it hard to hear? You don't have seats. No, they have seats. But there's no microphone. I try to raise my voice. You can come a bit closer if you wish. No, don't let the chairs move. Don't let the chairs move. If people at the back want to come and sit on the floor right here, you can. Although yeah. It might not be comfy. Might comfy. I'll keep trying to raise my voice. <laughs> so anyway, the, he came and told me he'd found a solution to the problem. Next time he went to a function where they had uh, alcohol being served, he refused the alcohol, but not because he was a Buddhist. He said, I cannot drink alcohol anymore because of doctor's orders. That's what he said to me, doctor's orders. That was accepted. But then I asked him, hey, you're keeping one precept by breaking another. Your doctor never told you not to drink. And that's when he taught me some Buddhism. You know, many times in the life of the Buddha, he compared himself to being a doctor. It was a doctor's orders, Dr. Buddha's orders. So that's one way of letting go. And one way of letting go, sometimes we let go of the wrong things and keep the, the things we should not really be accumulating. How many of you get tired in your jobs at work? How many of you experience stress arranging all these talks for me? <laughs> yeah, of course you do because it's really hard work. How many of you get stressed out because there's no microphone available? <laughs> Come on, let go. <laughs> yeah, because at least when I came in here, I thought, oh my goodness, this is a Scot London Scottish Association. I thought they may be practicing their bagpipes. I'm not quite sure if you've heard bagpipes. But I remember just going to this function, there was bagpipes being played all over the place, and they walked away, it was in a procession. And I thought, oh, peace at last. <laughs> and then they turned around and came back again. <laughs> you know those processions people have in bagpipe bands? But nevertheless, it was at least uh, temporary, it came and went. But nevertheless, it's maybe okay in a battle somewhere, but when you're a Buddhist monk, you are very, very sensitive, and I prefer the silence. So how can you let go when there's lots of noise around? It's not that hard. I kind of told this story a couple of days ago. One of the monks who was staying with me, he was from, uh, from Switzerland, and he asked me, he said, my brother wants to come and visit. And I said, there's no place for him to stay. And this monk said, he can stay with me in my hut. The huts for monks are very small, maybe three meters by 2.4. He said, what happens if your brother starts snoring? And he said, I've figured that out already. I'll make sure I go to sleep first. <laughs> and when I snore, my brother won't be able to go to sleep at all, so he can't snore. <laughs> it's not very nice, is it? And because of things like that, of course, you know what happened. His brother went to sleep first and started snoring. It's a small room. Can you sleep if somebody's snoring in your house? Very difficult but he had this wonderful way of letting go. It wasn't just letting go, he just changed his perception of what snoring was. He was a very highly educated young man in Switzerland, 
And so he started listening carefully to the snoring. Have you ever really listened to it? Or you always try to put your fingers in your ears or put your pillow over your head and try and block it all out. Instead of blocking it out, he let it in. And when he let it in, he noticed a very weird phenomena about snoring. The way his brother snored was like the most modern, the most state-of-the-art music, which had no form, no rhythm. <laughs> no, it was like rebellious, like reactionary music, the sort of things you know, when I was young, you had these reactionary musicians, please excuse me, Sex Pistols, and other people, they just tried to break all conventions. And they really didn't break many conventions at all. But this monk's brother, he broke every convention in music. And so when he was listening to this sound, after a while it became so interesting. One of the most original little sonatas through the nose he'd ever heard in his life. And so because of that, that was the last thing he said he remembered. He woke up early in the morning and he remembered this beautiful, state-of-the-art, incredible music from his brother. He changed it from something which was irritating to something which was interesting. And through that little change of perception, he could let it go. And that's been one of the things which, as a monk, we've been taught to do and trained to do, you know, for so many years. But I was saying that many of us get very, very, very busy. I don't get very, very, very busy. I get very, 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 very busy. <laughs> Go up a standard or two. But anyhow, I don't just have a monastery, I have a monastery, a nunnery, a city centre, a retreat centre, goodness knows how many other jobs and roles. But I did notice one day, I'd just been very busy in our city centre all weekend, teaching and talking and counselling and committee meetings, admin, goodness knows what else. And then I went back to monastery on Sunday night, Monday morning had all the guests and the monks to talk to. And I remember this one man coming and he said, oh, what a peaceful monastery you have. Now, one thing about being a monk, you have to be honest. And I say, it's not peaceful. This is my workplace. It may be peaceful for you. You just come in there and admire all the trees and the gardens. I'm the one who have to make sure the trees whose limbs get uh, broken by the wind have to be sawn up all the leaves have to be raked, all the gardens have to be watered, all the monks have to be taught, all the visitors have to be attended to, all the problems, the water needs to be fixed. There's so many problems in a monastery. And then I realised I was in error. This visitor could enjoy every moment of the monastery and I could not see that because I was in charge of it. So from that day I made a resolution. And I said, yes, you make a similar resolution in your life. Every Monday morning, when I woke up, I would make sure I was not the head monk, I was not the abbot of the monastery in which I was in charge. I pretended I was a visitor. So if any of you came and said, oh, Ajahn Brahm, can I ask some questions on meditation? Ajahn Brahm's not here today. I'm only visiting. Or <laughs> well, one of the monks said, look, all the water is uh, blocked. No water's coming out of the systems. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to fix it. I'm not at work today. <laughs> when any visitor came and said, you know, can you come and solve this problem or do some chanting for me? I'm getting married today. Can you give a chant for me? Sorry, I'm only visiting today. Sometimes that really helped. As soon as I wasn't in charge and never assumed I owned the monastery where I was a senior monk. As soon as you realise you don't own Anukampa Bhikkhuni project, 
then you can take a rest. It's only temporary, only one morning a week. But that morning, I could see the monastery in which I lived, just as you could see it, with the eyes of a visitor, not with the eyes of an owner. When you go back to your apartment this evening, or your house, or wherever you're living, if you think that's your house, your apartment, oh my goodness, there's so much work to be done. If you go instead to a restaurant, after you've had your food, do you ever have to wash up afterwards? Do you ever have to put all the plates away? Do you ever have to clean up? You don't have to do anything when you're just a visitor, except just enjoy the food. If you're an owner, that's where the problem starts. And that's also the case when a monk gets sick or a nun gets sick. I look at my body, I don't own it. I'm just visiting for a few years, 70 or 80 years. I care for it, but I don't ever think it's mine. I don't own it. So who owns your body and my body? The answer is very simple. It's nature owns it, not you. So when you think like that, if there's any sickness, you kind of don't try and control your body to make it better. You work with nature to try and make it better, if it's at all possible. A good example of that, how many of you here, be honest, how many of you here have never ever been sick in your life? Never been sick. No one's got their hand up. Can I assume each one of you from time to time have been sick? Imagine if you could put your hand up and said you've never been sick, never ever. You would be so weird. There'd be something essentially wrong with you. That these hospitals will take you in for tests to find out why you don't get sick. So if you're really healthy all the time, there's something very wrong with you. If you're sick from time to time, you're okay. So why on earth, when you're sick, do you go and see the doctor and say, doctor, there's something wrong with me. I'm sick. Never do that. Instead, when you go and see the doctor, doctor, there's something right with me. I've got COVID again. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with having COVID? It's natural. So don't sort of discriminate against it and say there's something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong at all. That's just what happens. How many of you always want to be positive in life? Please never be positive when you do a COVID test. <laughs> there are some times when it's good to be negative. Sometimes people, the last time I was in Sri Lanka, you know, people said you shouldn't be attached to anything. I said, yes, you must be attached. When you're on the back of a motorbike, go down a busy road, please stay attached. <coughs> There are some things to let go of and some things to be attached to for your health and well-being. But anyway, I say that thing about ill health because sometimes we give it such a bad uh, rapport that people feel that there's something wrong being sick and they feel there's something wrong with you because you're sick. You made some big mistake in life. You should have exercised more. You should have eaten much more healthy food and not drank so much coffee. <laughs> that was just an excuse to take a sip. But really, why do we discriminate against ourselves and blame ourselves for things like sickness? Instead of realizing that sickness is part of life. And if we make peace with things, instead of getting uh, upset by things and thinking that sickness is a personal failure, 
Imagine how that would change your life. A lot of times, I mentioned already that I've spent so many hours of my life teaching and talking to people with cancers, and so much of those cancers are because of people who are just too stressed out in their life. They're too tense. Even in psychology, it's the same. There was this guy who went to see his psychologist, a very weird. He said that sometimes, sometimes he's sure he's a marquee. And other times, he's sure that he's a wigwam. And the psychologist was a student of mine, he got the answer very quickly. Sometimes a marquee, sometimes a wigwam. Your problem is you're too tense. <laughs> okay, you're allowed to groan. <laughs> what do you expect with a talk from Ajahn Brah? <laughs> do you get the joke? Yeah. A tent, like a well, wigwam is a tent. A marquee is a tent. So he thought he was sometimes a marquee, sometimes a wigwam. That's why he was too tense. I do try. <laughs> anyway, thank you. But anyhow, one of the problems... Oh, what was this? This was a nice, interesting story recently. There was this lady in Hong Kong called Anita Murajani. She was on the, she wrote a book and she was also on the TV doing these interviews and relating her out of the body experience. Because her problem, you know, she had a very, very, very bad cancer and eventually while she was being operated on, she died on the operating table and had what we call the out of body experience. And she survived that. When she came back to tell the tale, the first thing she said was, my cancer is cured. And the doctors were just uh, gobsmacked, as I say in Australia, so surprised. The tumours are still there, you haven't cured the cancer. But what she said, that while she was having this out-of-body experience, she floated up towards the light, and she entered that light. Those of you who do meditation know that's like the nimitta experience. And when she was in that light, she was so blissed out, having a wonderful time. When she came out afterwards, she had the insight, the cause of her cancer. The cause of her cancer was she was trying so hard throughout her whole life to try and please others. Even though the other people would look at her life, she was very successful, had a nice family, had hardly many problems at all. But that stress of trying to please others throughout her whole life had caused that stress which had caused the cancer. She said, I know not to do that anymore. And interesting, she, her cancer just disappeared very, very quickly after that. But one of the interesting parts of that story, not just actually being able to see that you know, after she died and going into this uh, meditation experience, one of the interesting parts of that was her doctor, her GP in Hong Kong at the time, was this Westerner called Brian Walker. And this was totally impossible according to everything he'd learned in medicine. And so Dr. Brian Walker, the GP, was so surprised at this, he changed a lot of how he looked at medicine. And he left Hong Kong, and you know where he migrated to? Western Australia. To this small town south of Perth called Serpentine where my monastery is, and he's now officially my GP. <laughs> it's true, he's my GP. I hardly ever have to see him except for other monks' problems. But nevertheless, it was something which changed his life. Seeing things which you don't expect to happen, happening. And when that kind of happened, he's 
deep meditation, you let go so much. For her, it was letting go of her body and senses and going towards this light, that light which people see when you die. You'll all see that one day. Please understand what it is. It is just the way that you perceive this thing we call the mind, your mind. I'll say just one more thing about that before I go back on course and letting go. That mind, that sixth sense, it was always, it's always called the sixth sense in Buddhism and in Asia, but even the Greek philosophers would always have six senses. You know, Plato and Aristotle will always call, talk about the six senses. And they call this sixth sense the mind, and they also termed it the common sense. Because whatever your mind knows, so whatever your eye sees, your ear hears, or your uh, tongue tastes, your, your nose smells, or your body touches, whatever the five senses do, your mind can know that. That's why it's called the common sense. And in the two and a half thousand years since Plato and Aristotle, the West has lost its mind. We've abandoned our common sense. To us, just five senses is all that's important, rather than this thing inside, called the mind, your emotional world, which is not part of the five senses. It's not a byproduct of a brain, it's totally independent. And I love stories about when the mind is obviously not part of the brain. One of those stories is what happens when a person does die. They've got something, how many doctors or nurses, especially in terminal care, are there here this evening? There's something which we call terminal lucidity. Have you heard that term before? It's a medical term. Terminal lucidity refers to that many occasions when a person, before they die, they may be in a coma, they may be drugged up with morphine, they may be incoherent, you know, in some sort of coma, not able to notice people around or communicate with anybody. In the last few moments or minutes before they pass away, they can remember everything and talk to people. Once when I mentioned that uh, over in my uh, temple in Perth, I asked if anybody had such experiences. And one of the doctors told me just you know, publicly, just a few days before, one of his patients started the dying process you know, quicker than expected. And so he rushed to the bedside. They were in a coma. And the instructions were that in the little drawer next to the bed, there was a book. And in that book, it was an address book, telephone book, of all the closest relations. So please give them a call when I'm about to die. And that's what this doctor did. He, you know, rang up the wife, uh, rang up the, the, one of the sons. When he started ringing up the daughter, I still remember, because this made a great impression on me, Julie. He rang Julie up. Your father's dying. Please come to the hospital as soon as you can. And at that point, this dying man opened his eyes, turned to see the doctor, and said, please tell Julie how much I love her. And then the next moment he died. Terminal lucidity is what happens when it's like all your, your memories and knowledge are right there back again, just a few moments before you pass away. Even, I remember reading this article by a doctor over in New York, whose example of terminal lucidity was with a patient who had a, a brain cancer. The cancer was eating, not eating, but colonizing the brain. 
and it was such a steady uh, decline, the doctor could know, could predict exactly when this person's going to pass away. And was explaining to the family that at the very end, the brain would not be functional anymore. There'd be nothing to be able to, to remember or to talk. The only part of the brain left would be served, be serving just the heartbeat and the, what else? Sorry? Breathing? Breathing, yeah. Just to keep him alive. And so, he said the last few moments, he'd just be like in a coma. And that's what it was like. He was in a coma, not able to respond to anything until he got into this quite prolonged state of terminal lucidity. <clears throat> the doctor was called because he could have this wonderful conversation with all of his family who were there, remembering every one of them, being able to talk so easily with each one of them before he passed away. And I remember just being with many people who were dying, and one person I will always remember that uh, he was from Lancashire, his name was Ted, and he was dying in hospital. Have you ever been with people dying? He could no, hardly breathe. He was like kind of in a coma. We're just waiting for the last breath to go out and the next breath not to come in again. Many times we thought he was close, but then he breathed again. Because I was with him at that time, and because monks can only eat in the morning time, it got so close to the cut-off point for lunch and I hadn't eaten anything yet, the daughter, very kindly, just went out to get some fast food, like from some chicken and chips, that's all you could get. And so it is the custom in UK, if you have some chips, you always offer it to somebody else, have a chip. <laughs> and that's what the daughter did. Said to her dad, who was having a hard time breathing, and just was unconscious for the last the three or four hours. Hey dad, do you want a chip? And that was her father's last words. Yes, I'll have a chip. <laughs> he was a, a proud Lancastrian to the end, <laughs> keeping the old traditions. I don't know there's many Polish people here. I've met a few coming in here. What's your favorite food in Poland? Potato. So, when you die, I'll ask you, I'll ask you, do you want a potato? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your last words. Yes, but, please. sorry? Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. We're not allowed to die yet. So, anyhow, just these little things about who is actually saying that at the very end? Your brain is not functioning anymore. That is the thing we call the mind. And the other part of the, uh, this terminal lucidity is even the, I haven't got a word for it yet, but it's happened a few times, is when a person is born. I don't know if you've ever seen this, it's much more rare, but because I talk a lot about this, people come and tell me their stories. And the first time was when this, uh, English, this Aussie couple, they weren't Buddhists, they weren't Christians, they were just an ordinary couple who didn't really have any religion. When their second child was born, brought him home from hospital and was in the uh, recliner or pram, whatever you call it, I still don't know the right name for that. Sorry? It's a pram. A pram. Okay. But I've never had kids, so what would I know? <laughs> but anyhow, He's only been born a few weeks, maybe two or three weeks, just back from hospital. And then uh, they told their older son, Peter, just go and say good night to your baby brother, Paul. And so the kid went over to the pram, leaned over and said, good night, Paul. And Paul said, good night, Peter. <laughs> and that kind of was quite shocking. That's not what you expected, a two or three week old kid. 
one thing I didn't tell the last time I told a story was that kid spoke not in like, like a kiddie language, but like an adult. The words were fully formed. And then they were so shocked, they stopped what they were doing, looked at their two kids, and their elder kid, without prompting, said again, good night, Paul. And Paul replied, this time with both of them looking, good night, Peter. He spoke a few days after it was born. And they said they came to see the Buddhist monks because they thought we knew much more about what happens when people are born and when people die. Of course, we're the experts. Because Buddhists, we've been born many times. We believe in rebirth and reincarnation. If you don't believe in many lives, what would you know about life and death? You've only got one life to remember. <laughs> so anyhow, those are interesting stories which I wouldn't share with you if you didn't check them out and know they were absolutely true. They actually change the way we look at things. And one of the advantages of that is that when, you know, especially someone you love and really care for dies, how can you let them go? You miss them so much, except maybe if you know they're coming back again. This story. So I'm a bit tired, so I can't tell all the stories. Am I over time already? No, you can tell Okay. No, I, I'm not... I thank you for being the, the timekeeper, because I can't pay attention to time. Yeah. So and I go over time and get locked in. This is London Scottish Rifle Volunteers. <laughs> They'll shoot us if we go over time. That's what it says. Anyway, so this again, a personal story, because I actually saw this. This Thai couple, they had their first kid, gave them lots of blessings. And then just before she gave birth, you know, the baby turned in the womb and choked off its blood supply in the umbilical cord. So it was still born. It was called Charlie. I did the funeral service for little Charlie. One thing I thought was really cute, the child was fully formed. So they dressed it up, they lifted up the small coffin. We had a family photograph. And so at least uh, Charlie got into the family album, but then was obviously cremated. But one thing I never saw at the time, and if ever you have these experiences, of a young child you really care about passes away, I recommend you try this. They got a, a biro pen and just did a little line just on the heel, on the side, not underneath, on the side, you know, maybe two inches long. You normally don't have birthmarks on the heel like that. They did that because they know it was kind of a bit of bad luck that the baby had died and they cremated it. They told me about that. And then later on, she was a young woman, she got pregnant again and had another baby. And this time that baby has got the birthmark. It's obvious that that was a baby reborn again. It didn't make it in this life, but it made it in the next life. And I often mention this because sometimes it's like, you know, you book a ticket on an aircraft and you get bumped off the aircraft. It's too full. What do they do if they bump you off the aircraft? What they do is they usually get you the next flight and give you an upgrade. So that's what happened to Charlie. He got on the next available position in his mum's womb and got an upgrade. He was born as Annie, female. <laughs> I was just waiting for your reaction. <laughs> All your women here should like that story.
And it's wonderful to see these events because you don't just say this is an interesting story. It means that, you know, if your child does die, there's a great opportunity. You can let it go because you know that there's a nice possibility it will come back again. I've seen that so many times. Sri Lankan family, whose little seven-year-old kid was on his bicycle going to school one morning. Interestingly, the father said he knew that something was up. He was in his car in another part of town, but drove to check up on his son and found he was struggling for breath by the side of the road. Some of the other kids were trying to look after him. They called an ambulance, but he didn't make it. He died. And his mother was obviously a seven-year-old kid, dying like that. They found out he had some congenital heart disease. No one's fault. And for uh, counselling and trying to make the mother especially feel a little bit more supported, I told these stories about kids coming back again, especially if it's you know, in a family, you know, close to the family, or even as uh, another son in that family. The mother was, who lost her kid, was still reasonably young, so she too got pregnant again and gave birth. And that kid, as soon as was born, the doctors saw had the same condition as a previous kid who had died. And the doctor took that kid into the hospital, but this time knew exactly what to do. And the doctor apparently was the same doctor who had treated the, the first kid, this, this new kid's uh, elder brother who passed away. Not only that, but uh, they knew exactly the condition so they could save its life, and it survived, it's grown up now. The kid before comes back again. <coughs> you know, sometimes that possibility can sometimes help people, <coughs> give them some hope. This is not one life, because it's just one life that's kind of unfair. It helps you let go much more easily. Other Q and A soon. Q &A soon. Okay. So one other thing is about what makes people suffering, not just attachment, but some of the upset and anger which you have when you're not treated properly. Is there one person in this life you know you can't forgive? One person whose memory just gives you so many uh, heartaches. Not your fault, somebody else's fault, so you think. Why can't we let that go? There's a few times, the stories which I remember, these are reading stories, which sometimes make you almost cry. One of those stories was in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, you know, with Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. They were offering amnesty, complete legal forgiveness to anybody, no matter what crime they had done, as long as they would admit it truthfully and confess. It was the only way they could think they could find some healing and let go of all those terrible things which were done during the apartheid years. And so this one South African, white South African police officer, secret police officer, was confessing how he had murdered, extrajudicial murder and tortured beforehand, this black South African activist. And it was gross what happened. To give you an example, I don't mean to upset you, but just to make sure that you know what's, what happens sometimes. He was describing how he'd take this black South African's male organ, you know, his penis, and get a nail out and put a nail through it onto the table. All you guys here, you know, that's 
that gives you goosebumps, not goosebumps, but shivers. And that's actually how they were treated. And he was shaking, telling all these terrible things which he'd done, this black South African activist, extra, extrajudicial, and finally th literally throwing him out the window to his death. While this was happening, the man's widow was listening. All she'd known is police come in the middle of the night taking her husband away. And he disappeared. Never knew what happened to him. Now she was hearing it. And as she was listening, the guy was just shaking and crying. You know, with the shame of it and the terrible thing he'd done. And that widow, hearing for the first time how her husband had been treated, jumped over the barricade separating her from the other police officers and the other people on trial, evaded two security officers and went for that guy and put her big African arms around him and hugged him said, I forgive you. Even when I tell that, I remember reading that story, just, you get teary-eyed or you just cry. That's how much you can forgive. And sometimes that forgiveness is beautiful. I don't know if you read the story about one of the survivors of Auschwitz. This young lady who was, had a twin sister, the two twins were selected to be experimented on. I think you know those stories, you may have heard them or read about them. But this survivor, her sister had died, but this lady survived. So her sister had died, but this lady survived. She had all the memories. But then she managed to find, just by chance, one of the people who'd experimented on her, one of the doctors who'd fled to Argentina. And when she found him, she told him, meet me in Auschwitz. The fellow was terrified, because basically he'd been busted. He would go to jail forever. So he went to Auschwitz and met her. In Auschwitz, that's where she said, it's a terrible thing which you did to myself and my sister but I forgive you. She could forgive him in the place where that all, all had happened. Remember when she was writing about it afterwards, she said, now she wasn't a victim anymore. She was a victor. By that great act of forgiveness, she never needed to feel that thirst for revenge or their anger against a person. She could let it go. If you haven't let go yet of some of the terrible things which have been inflicted on you by others, then you are a victim. If you can forgive, then you become a victor. And that's the difference, that's called letting go. And I wish those type of stories, that's why I kind of cried when I heard those stories. It brings hope into this world. Otherwise, if we can't forgive, the tit for tat, revenge, I'll give you back more than you gave me to teach you a lesson. It gets worse and worse and worse. And there'll never be any peace in this world. So anyway, that's very Buddhist philosophy. So anyway, now is the time for questions and answers. Now usually I say the three C's. Questions, comments and complaints. Sorry? Till 20 past. Oh, you've got 40 minutes. Oh, I've got, okay, I see you first of all. One, two and then three. And then the other side afterwards. Yes? Um, my question is about being a bus. And oh, yeah. how do you let go when you're um, seeing world events like what's happening in Israel and Gaza? 
if I stop thinking about it, I feel guilty. But if I do think about it, I feel paralyzed. Yes. So what to, what to actually do is that sometimes if you can do something about it, wonderful. But if you can't do anything about it, a lot of times you getting personally involved makes the situation much worse. And you can actually look at it upon it in, in different ways of perceiving. <coughs> For example, why do those situations keep arising? Why do we have like governments who actually can be quite violent? Is there no other way? Why? I don't know what country you come from. Do you live in UK? Why do you vote for people in, the, in an election? Is it because of what they promised to do for you? You know the word for a candidate in an election? It comes from a Latin word meaning white, candid. And because in Rome, every candidate for election would wear white. They would stand for election on the grounds of their past virtuous conduct. Like even now in Buddhism, you wear white if you're going to the Buddhist talk today. You wear white as a symbol you're keeping the five precepts or eight precepts. Wearing of white has been traditionally a symbol of, of purity. That's why in Rome, senators would always wear white before they're elected. They were elected or not elected on what they'd done in the past, on their virtuous conduct, never for what they promised to do. These days, people are elected because what they promised to do. And you can't know what situation you have to deal with in the future. That's one of the reasons why it'd be wonderful if you didn't vote or pay any attention to what a person promises to do for you, but how they behaved in the past. That's a much better guide to having a successful government. But a lot of times we don't listen. Just what a person promises and they buy us. And that's where we get in a lot of trouble. So we learn from these, it's like wake up calls. And even things like, like in Gaza, you no know, religion. What difference really is there between a Jewish person or a Palestinian Muslim? What difference is there? We emphasize those differences out of ignorance. That's one of the reasons why, when I've been asked that question before, I do recall a disciple over in Singapore. She is a Buddhist married to a Christian. They've got two children. One's a Hindu, one's a Muslim. And I've been encouraging them for years to have another child. <laughs> have a Jew, get the full five. You know what my name means? Ajahn Brahm, B for Buddhist, R for Roman Catholic, A for Anglican, H for Hindu, and M for Muslim. There was no J in there yet, but that's in the Ajahn at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> of course I made that up. But nevertheless, it's a nice way of just showing, just, you know, to be inclusive. Religions should never be exclusive. I, honestly, I spent a lot of time in my early life over in uh, Australia making, or breaking, sorry, those boundaries between religions. And one of my best friends, he was the abbot of a Catholic monastery up there, Benedictine monastery. Uh, abbot Placid, his name was. We had a lot of fun together. When I went through his monastery, one of the oldest buildings in Western Australia, I couldn't help but ask him, this is such an old building. 
are there any ghosts in here? And he said, oh, no, 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 in the Catholic Church we don't believe in ghosts. I had him. I said, what about the Holy Ghost then? <laughs> and he poked me, oh, I jumped wrong. <laughs> you got me that time. Or the, uh, the Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Bernstein, Moshe Bernstein, he was also a good friend. One of the reasons was, I remember asking him once, I said, Does, in Judaism, do you believe in rebirth? He said, oh yes, yeah, we believe in rebirth as well. I was quite surprised, the first time I heard that. And then I went to see some other more senior Jewish rabbi, and I said, I never realised you believe in rebirth. And he said, we don't. <laughs> you know, Moshe Bernstein, he's a rabbi, he told me he did. Oh yeah, that's Rabbi Bernstein. <laughs> he was a rebel. That's why he was a good friend. <laughs> and the other person which I really got on with uh, was the dean of the cathedral, John Shepherd. And this dean of the cathedral, you know, one day, you know, we used to talk together, and he said, you know, you give good talks, Ajahn Brahm, much better than the people which I ordain as, as vicars and priests. Why don't you give a talk at the cathedral on a Sunday at a Eucharist. Why not? So apparently what he said, and I've got no doubt that this is true because he, he's done his research, that was the first time a non-Christian gave the Sunday sermon at a Eucharist in the cathedral in 2,000 years. I, I, I consider that to be one of the greatest honours of my life, monastic life. And it was wonderful to experience because I had a few of my friends, they were ex-policemen, and they said, you need security. Because <laughs> now sometimes there's some crazy people. And sure enough, I didn't need security because the place was packed and no one knew who was a Buddhist or who was a Christian because they just came in and packed the place out. And then a couple of uh, crazy Christians came in and said, this is defiling a sacred place, making a big noise. And then some of the, uh, the Anglican staff, they just took hold of those two and threw them out and locked the door. They weren't allowed in to the cathedral. Buddhists were. I thought that was amazing, that this is what life should be. Imagine if after the conflicts in Palestine and uh, Israel has stopped, to have a reconciliation service you know, between uh, Palestinians, uh, Egyptians, Israelis or whatever. So we don't know who's who. And anyway, Jesus was a Palestinian. Was he? That's where he was born. So that's one of the things it's teaching us. When it gets to such a degree of conflict, there's nothing much we could do. It's already gone too far. Can we not stop that happening ever again? Please? Remember in the, the film of Gandhi, I remember this scene someone showed me. There was a, a Hindu. His child, his only son, had been slaughtered by Muslims in India. So he was very upset and wanted revenge. And also just lost your son. And in the film he was asking Gandhi, help, what should I do? And Gandhi said, look, there's so many other children have lost their parents. Please adopt one. And this Hindu father, and bring him up as a Muslim. <laughs> now that's the sort of thing which stops this feeling these are different people, they're not the same as us and we can destroy them. We have to live together. 
It's the thing I see in Gaza and in Israel. By destroying one, you're destroying yourself. There's no place where anyone can live. Does that make any sense to you? It, it does. It doesn't make it easy to be a bystander sometimes. <coughs> it's easy. Remember in this world, you know, this is part of the Buddhism, there is a lot of suffering, but the suffering has a meaning. Being a bystander has a meaning to it. And that meaning is to learn, to be reminded that instead of maybe uh, blaming governments, maybe there's something we could have done. Even a small thing, even like an adopting a Palestinian or something, someone who's got no home, and bringing him up as a Muslim, even though he may be a Buddhist. That's the only thing I can suggest. Oh yes, yeah. two, three, okay. Who was the next one? I had his arms up. Oh yes, yes, okay. <laughs> Um, my friend and I have been thinking about sort of rebuff and trying to understand rebuff and the influence on it. So we're wondering if you could explain a bit about that and especially like how can we as um, young practitioners or like people who have just sort of started our way to and understand this? Okay. <laughs> yes, the subject was about rebirth and how can you understand it or accept it? You know, one thing, one, one objection which people have to rebirth is there's probably more people alive today on this earth than, has, than have ever died. I remember in a maths class, it's a very simple calculation. So if everybody was reborn, you know, from another human life, how can there be so many people on this planet? And the answer is you're not just reborn human to human to human to human. There are many other realms of existence, and one of those realms of existence is the animal realm. Now, how many animals have got no place to survive in, in the rainforests and jungles of our world? And sometimes when I see some very violent people, so I think, oh, that's maybe where they came from. Maybe there were gorillas in their past life. <laughs> gorillas in their past life? <laughs> gorillas are peaceful. Peaceful, okay. Uh, doesn't work, okay. Tigers. Tigers. Boa constrictors. But anyway, we all, <laughs> we all know there's far fewer animals alive today than there have ever been. I'm going to tell the story. Here we go. I told you this earlier. In one of the monasteries in the northeast of Thailand, Ajahn Thuy's monastery in the northeast, that uh, if anybody ever sees like an animal being mistreated, they will often buy it and to save its life out of compassion and send it to a monastery because we look after these animals. So they saw a monkey in a cage in the market and they felt so sad for it, they brought it and they released it in this forest monastery. And this little monkey just was so happy to be free, but to be looked after and safe. And if you ever went to that monastery at that time, that little monkey identified with being like a human being, that's all he ever saw. So every afternoon when the monks had a cup of tea, that monkey had to have a cup of tea as well. And it was really cute, sitting around with the, with the other monks, sipping his tea. And anyhow, that, that monkey became kind of part of the community, was so protective that if anyone made a loud noise, especially cars on the outside road of the monastery, that little monkey would chase the cars. Just like, you know, dogs chase the cars. But one day this monkey chased a truck and unfortunately got run over by the truck and killed. And the head monk was meditating at the time and actually saw the stream of consciousness. This is actually how it works. 
not a soul, but a stream of consciousness going from the dead monkey's body into the womb of a mother who was pregnant in the village. And he told the other monks that. That's something he shouldn't have done. Because all the other monks were really interested. They went in that village for arms every day. What would happen when that baby gets born? I wasn't there at the time, but the other monks told me that that little baby came out of his mother's womb exceptionally hairy. <laughs> it was a monkey before, and they all knew that. That poor little kid, when he went to school, when he was growing up, he had that stigma with him for the rest of his life. A monkey reborn as a human. So any of you mothers or fathers, if you have a little kid and you say you're a little monkey, you don't know how true that could be. <laughs> but anyway, rebirth, you can tell stories, but that doesn't really cut it. What really convinces you about rebirth, if it is someone in your family, and then you know that's true, or even better, those meditations where you can get so peaceful and so still, that when you're emerging from that meditation, you ask yourself, what is my earliest memory? If your mind has got into a still meditation, memories come up really easily, straight away. And because, for those of you who know meditation, when you are very still, the five hindrances, such as doubt, disappear as well. You don't bend the truth. What comes up is real. And when you can remember your own past lives, it explains a lot about who you are and why you do what you do. And then once you have those memories, there's no doubt anymore about the truth of rebirth. You can check it up. One of our members in Perth, he was the president of our Buddhist society for a while. And he got his rebirth experiences through hypnotic regression. It was all absolutely true. Even remembering the place where he was buried. All the names of his wife, his name before, the piece of land he was granted by the government, where he was married. All the evidence was there in the BT Library in Perth. And interestingly, for those who are Buddhist here, once he checked it up and found it was all incredibly true, he was in the Navy before. He used to like drinking alcohol. But as soon as he remembered his past life, he couldn't drink alcohol anymore. He just I can't do it anymore. Sometimes the memory of your past lives gives you what we call the bigger picture about what your meaning of life is. One single life is not really enough to understand why you're here and what you're doing, what you're supposed to be doing. Why you married who you did marry. Why you chose that lifestyle, that job. But after a while, if you can remember your past lives, it all kinds of fits together. There's a meaning with a big picture. And it's also, it takes away the gender discrimination. When you realize you were a man before, you were a woman before, you were in between before. When you get a bigger picture, you get much more empathy for people being in situations which you're not in in this lifetime, you were in the last. You get empathy if you've been in a war zone and been blown up or killed, slaughtered. You're not a bystander, you're actually involved. You know what it feels like. You never want that to happen ever again. You get much more empathy when you actually feel that. So that's one way of doing it. That's why I love trying to get people to remember their past lives. Few people can do it, I wish more people could. Oh yeah. Hello. Uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, you kind of touched a bit upon it. What, for you, what is the meaning of life? 
meaning of life is to learn, to learn enough so you know who you are, what you're made of, and how you can serve and be compassionate and kind. Every act of kindness, compassion, and service you do, that becomes the most important. I'll give you an example, I've been saying this to a few people. You know that when Buddhists see a Buddha statue, we usually bow to it? Why? Don't just say it's tradition, because sometimes tradition is what creates wars, doesn't solve them. So, I'm in Australia. How do you get Aussies to bow to a Buddha statue? It's very easy. What I do is say, I don't bow to a piece of wood or a piece of metal or a piece of whatever. I bow to what it represents. And to me, the three things which a Buddha represents to me are virtue, goodness, trustworthiness. That's something, it's wonderful to be living with other monks and nuns, people I can trust. What they say is what they mean. They don't lie. They don't try and deceive. I can trust. And that means that virtue makes my life so much easier. Wouldn't you like to live with another person in life who's totally trustworthy? They make mistakes, but they, they own up. And that makes life so much more rewarding. And the second thing which I bow to is peace. You know, peace in a monastery, peace in my own body, so everything which I eat doesn't affect me, it just goes down and just, yeah, it goes out sometimes, but it mostly goes down. <laughs> And just in a peace in my uh, peace in London. It's wonderful being able to just even at the station this morning in Oxford, just asking a question of one of the guards. And he said, It's wonderful because we got there early, just waiting around for half an hour. He said, It's wonderful looking at you. You're not like other people, you're peaceful. So that's what we should all be like. That peace which you feel inside of you is one of the most important things you can worship. You can worship a god or a statue if you wish, but it's much more, more important to worshiping peace. Peace inside of you, peace in your family, peace in your life, peace in the world. So when I bow, I remember the importance of peace. That's why I worship it. And the last one is worshiping compassion, kindness. Every time you see a really nice, beautiful act of kindness, like forgiveness, that gives hope in this world. And sometimes you see just, like even in, uh, in Gaza Strip, an Israeli soldier guarding and helping a Hamas um, fighter. They see what they share in common. They say, I'm going to help you, guard you care for you. Those acts of kindness and compassion, those are the ones which you know, give meaning in life. So those three things is what I always remember when I bow. Virtue, peace and compassion. And that's what gives life meaning. And I bow because I want to remember that every time which I bow. You don't have to be a Buddhist to bow like that. Should I do this side, Oh yeah, okay, yeah, I'm one-sided. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I was thinking uh, through the lens of past life and karma, um, how do we frame suicide? Frame suicide. Okay. I always like saying stories because that has more meaning than just having a theory. A few years ago, a Sri Lankan family in Perth came to see me early one morning because they'd woken up to find out their 17-year-old son on the end of a rope on the veranda of their house committed suicide. And you wake up to that. And so they were just so shocked. First of all, there are some Buddhist monks and nuns who say that if you commit suicide, that's such a terrible crime to do, such bad karma, you go straight to hell. For goodness sake, that is not true. 
And that just adds more, like salt into the wound of someone who's lost someone they loved. And now they think that they're going to be punished again. This particular kid was about to do exams, university entrance. I asked the parents, how many exams do you have to do? And they said, well, there's about four subjects, maybe two papers per subject. That's eight exams. How many questions in each exam? Say eight. So 64 questions you have to answer. What happened? What would happen if your son did the first 63 questions absolutely perfect, but really messed up on the last question? Does that mean they can't go to university? Of course not. 63 out of 64 is a pretty high score. So why do you ever think that because your son messed up the last question and just committed suicide, why do you think that doesn't mean he can't have a beautiful rebirth? You don't measure uh, a life or judge a life on just the way you die. You judge a life, if you are going to judge a life, on the way you lived. So suicides should be forgiven. Sometimes people have made a mistake, but it doesn't mean everything else they've done in their life wasn't a mistake. So everything was a mistake, <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> you can always just judge the whole life, not just the way it ended. Are there any suicides which were good? Sometimes there are. When people just sacrifice their life to save others. When a person just uh, runs across the road to push a kid out of the way of a truck and they die themselves. How do you feel of that? That's kind of heroic. Self-sacrifice. So there are some cases where, and this is for the Buddhists here, I'm not really so sure of my audience, but I'm going to ask you the question, did the Buddha commit suicide? What is committing suicide? Deliberately ending your life. Did the Buddha realize the last food he ate was going to kill him? Of course he did. Three months before, he deliberately gave up the life faculty and said, predicted he was going to die in three months' time, which he did. Was that suicide? I'm not going to answer that question because I want you to think. Many of you, if, especially if you're traditional Buddhists, just always just believe what monks say rather than thinking it out for yourself. So much so that when I was in Sri Lanka last June at a conference, a big conference, it was a question time. And these questions were written on pieces of paper and handed to me. And one of the questions was, they'd heard from several Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka that the Buddha was born in Sri Lanka. What do you think of that, Ajahn Brahm? And I replied immediately, the Buddha was not born in Sri Lanka. Everybody knows the Buddha was born in Australia. <laughs> And people remember that answer. They didn't believe it. <laughs> That's actually how you solve those problems. Did that kind of answer the question or not? I was thinking uh, uh, from an internal perspective of the person's suffering. Oh yeah, no, it doesn't end the suffering because afterwards you get reborn again. And in Buddhism, it's a silly thing to do. It doesn't solve any problem because you kill yourself and you're there again afterwards. <laughs> you can't do anything right. <laughs> but you learn. There's other ways of dealing with suffering rather than committing suicide. But there's also the voluntary assisted euthanasia. And for voluntary assisted euthanasia, these are people who make a conscious decision. It's usually not... A, what's the state of voluntary assisted euthanasia in UK? Allowed? No. no. Really? Not at all. Goodness gracious. It's more and more allowed in Australia. It's understanding 
the freedom of choice, as long as you are not compelled you know, by others. You're in your right mind, you have to be checked by a few doctors and psychologists, you've got a terminal disease which is, as far as anyone knows, is incurable, and then you decide, free choice, you're going to do this. It takes a long time, but people do it. The first person in Australia to take legally assisted voluntary euthanasia was a man called Mr. Dent. He was a Buddhist. And his reason for doing that, he said his wife was constantly having to look after him, almost 24 hours a day. She was offered respite, but you know, she was still really worn, worn out. And he thought there was no possibility of any any cure or any reasonable amelioration of his condition, it get worse and worse and worse. And he said that he was going to take voluntary assisted euthanasia out of love for his wife, to give her freedom. And that's what he did. I may argue with him, but it's his choice. He made it and I'll always support that. Okay. Okay, one behind. Yeah, go on. Hello. Um, ten years ago, I first uh, met you on the internet. I saw a video yeah. from you, how to deal with difficult people. And it made a really big impact on my life. And since then, I've been binge-watching you. <laughs> and I've learned so much from you in, those, in the first video that um, I then made a resolution to thank you in real life. So, ten years ago, I uh, got called to go to Australia, and um, I didn't know if you were alive. I was broke, and I also You made a really big impact on my life. Thank you. I think you are a true blessing for this world. Then uh, I met you, and uh, five years after that, I traveled back to, to Australia. And I then made a resolution to write a book. And, uh, I said thank you to you again. I put six pages of you into the book. <laughs> it's actually a pretty funny story about how I met you and the whole journey. <coughs> this actually sucks because I'm a keynote speaker normally, so <laughs> you should be able to do this stuff. <laughs> then um, I have the book with me, and if you want to read it, I don't know if you, I know you don't have a lot of stuff, so I have to have pages for you to read about it. But then I thought about the fact that the mentors that I've had, most of them have passed, and you are still alive. So my girlfriend and I made the effort to come here and uh, to thank you one more time. But before we fly back tomorrow morning, I would like to ask you a question, because it's been quite a tough year for us. We had to bury our first son during pregnancy last year. And I would like to know what questions can we ask ourselves regarding letting go and generally in life? What questions would you recommend so it becomes easier to, yeah. to let go? Sometimes I mentioned that Finding meaning in what you think has no meaning at all allows you to let go. And the meaning which you have when you lose, like a child which is almost there but doesn't quite make it, sometimes you understand that you're not alone in this. How many other people in this world also have pregnancies which are for one reason or another terminated? you'll understand how it feels. Next 
is understand the way beyond this. Once you have a meaning for it, how to get beyond that is to really, this is part of our life. It won't always be like this. Sometimes people say, well, I'm too old to get pregnant again. I'm not sure, but next life, the life afterwards, maybe you have to learn what it's like, you know, really to lose a kid. The way you learn that lesson, you can never walk past somebody who needs your help with a young kid ever again. And so that advice which I mentioned earlier with Gandhi, I'm not sure if you can have another kid. If you can, try again, never give up. If you can't, adopt one. Adopt one and really look after it. You maybe think, I didn't have you know, a kid which has got my genes, but I've got a kid who can receive my love and can grow in that love. And then you find it's another way of dealing with loss. Make something out of it. You know, I've often told the story, you've probably heard it ad infinitum about treading a dog poo, what do you do? You dig it under the mango tree and you get much sweeter mangoes. You've had the dog shit already. Dig it in. Grow more compassion. Does it have to be your kid? It becomes your kid when you give it lots of love and kindness. And then you find, ah, now this is what the meaning of that whole exercise was. It was painful. But you can actually make something beautiful out of that. Have you got any other kids or is that just the one? one. Yeah, adopt one. No, no, we <laughs> had a, uh, well, the first one, uh, you know, it died during the pregnancy, yeah. and then we had a miscarriage. Yeah. So no alive kids. Not yet. Not yet. Are you going to try again? Yes. Honestly, okay. Try again next time, and just really look after yourself. And sometimes, and they're not here today, sometimes there's a couple over in Bristol, and they really, 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 really wanted a kid. And they had to go through IV to get pregnant and eventually she was pregnant. She kept on ringing me up and calling me, do chanting, make sure it's working okay. And then I got the uh, email, there was no heartbeat for the kid. And I, so I told them straight away, don't give up yet. <laughs> don't give up. And did some really strong chanting and they sent an email back. It detected a heartbeat. That was Kalia the other day. And they're just so grateful. Sometimes, never give up. And your kindness, you know, your power, can sometimes get that kid going. And so, have another go. And when you do have a kid, you can name it Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Middle name. Middle name. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let me know. Okay. Where do you live? In uh, the Netherlands. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Already visited you twice and yeah. seven times. Beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. You visit again. If you visit now, I'm yeah. not there. <laughs> We're traveling around. <laughs> Okay, thank you for letting me know that. You, you can get all the empathy from everybody there. Mm -hmm. Just make something beautiful out of it. Yeah. There was another question over here. Quickly, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the question is, uh, since Buddha was the enlightened being and he has millions of life to perfect his last life, why then he will suffer from this entry before he will be? Well, the reason he did, he'd suffer from dysentery because he was a human being and human beings get sick, there's nothing wrong with being sick. It's not on the No. In any way, he didn't perfect his uh, parameters for life after life after life. That's one of the reasons why recently I was talking about the Gatikara Sutta. Please read that. There was this uh, man called Jyoti Pala at the time of the previous Buddha, Kasapa, and Jyotipala was invited by his best friend Gatikara, please go and see the Buddha Kasapa, it's really good to see a Buddha. 
and Jyoti Pali replied, what's the point of seeing this baldy false ascetic? That's what he said, baldy false ascetic. And anyway, eventually he got tricked into going to see the Kasapa and became a monk under Kasapa and that was a, f a previous life of Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. In a previous life, you know, not that long ago, even uh, Siddhartha Gautama in his life as Jyotipala would bad mouth another Buddha. It's not what people expect. You don't have to be that pure to be fully enlightened, to be a Buddha. You learn from mistakes. You don't expect to be perfecting everything for, for generation after generation after generation. I love that sutta. It confounds many false ideas. That's Ajman Kaya. Yeah. Oh, okay, time to finish. <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah, certainly, yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you. We've got some important uh, announcements, we've first got of all. A lot of things to share. So, firstly, thank you because this is the very last uh, talk of a two week tour, uh, sharing the Dhamma and bringing so many people, hopefully, some inspiration and some solid. And for me tonight, as I'm sure for everybody, it's been very powerful. I'm very sorry about the sound. I thought we were going to get sound, <laughs> microphones, but hopefully, you managed to pick up at least the energy and the compassion and some of the piece, and uh, everything has been recorded so you can watch it again. But I want to express my really heartfelt gratitude, which I can never do in words, to my wonderful teacher, Kalyanamitta Ajahn Brahm, for being a true example of peace, virtue and compassion. And, um, well, I have no words to say more than that, but also for helping with this project that Ajahn Brahm comes over for. He's trying to help create a monastery for fully ordained nuns. I'm the only one in England at the moment and uh, sometimes that's a bit lonely. But the bigger purpose of this place is to have a spiritual sanctuary for people just like everybody here. That we can be together, that we can learn together, we can grow together, we can practice kindness and compassion. Whatever religion you come from, whatever you're going through, and to have that communication, you know, whereby we can share the difficulties we experience in our life and realize that we're not alone. So the spiritual friendship and community, the Buddha said, was the whole of the spiritual life. But that's not just for monastics, that's for everybody. Um, without somebody to teach us the Dhamma, and in this case we're very fortunate to have Ajahn Brahm while well, you're still around, or uh, very round. I'm always <laughs> around. <laughs> Uh, without that, we can't actually practice because we do need some new conditioning in our mind. Otherwise, we're just rolling in our own patterns again and again. So it's really this seed that we need from the Buddha and passed down through the generations and through the monastic Sangha. So this is what we're trying to do to create more um, fully ordained, fully trained and deeply practiced monastics because... <coughs> This is how the Dhamma continues. Of course, lay people too can be a part of that, and you can grow, and you can teach as well. But we do need people who commit their whole lives to it, and I think you can see the difference that it makes when you hear the Dhamma from somebody who's perfected their sila and has developed deep peace and deep wisdom. So this is what we're trying to do, and these talks are a part of that. Um, but we also have news on that front that we are close to finding it. Well, we actually found a suitable property, really beautiful in Oxford, in the countryside, but very close to the city. And uh, the last few days, the reason we're both pretty tired now is we've been really trying to bring conditions together to, to procure that place. And we're still looking for more donations and maybe loans because it's a bit of a stretch. But we have a property to sell in Oxford the place I'm living now, it's a small vihara, four bedroom, terrace house. Um, and with the money from that, we could buy this place, but we the agent won't wait. So if we want to do this, we need help. And for anyone who wishes to make it come true, to, um, 
to be involved in whatever way you can. You know, it doesn't have to be monetarily, but it can be just by lending your emotional, spiritual support or volunteering with us, whatever uh, you feel called to do. So I wanted to let Ajahn say a few words because you came yeah. to see that place with me. It was very uh, unexpected, but it all kind of came together. We went together to see this place. And, uh, this is a else. monastery especially for women. There are many Buddhist monasteries for men. How many do you know are especially for women, for bhikkhunis, for equity? It was about 13, 14 years ago, I did the first ordination over in Australia for bhikkhunis, got into big trouble with that, something I'm very proud of. I am rebellious, as you know, I said that already, but it's something which needed to be done. The next stage is to have a place where they can practice and live just like the monks can do so. So I bust my butt trying to do all of this. So now I ask each one of you, if you can, if you want to make a donation for the, the new Wihara, the forms are outside. Uh, I think the loans, I think we're going to get some loans oh, yeah. from Perth. You know, I was committee meeting on Sunday, so I talk all the committee members into, look, we've got money in the bank there, we'll send it over to UK, and this is a loan but we're not going to sort of hassle you to get it back. Let's if no, I, no, we I, give it back yeah, I know, but if that was me. I know. I know. So if any of you want to do something good and see something for women in the future here, equity. How many Buddhist monks have you seen here in UK? How many Buddhist women have you seen? They're not fully ordained though. The, the thing is with the ordination, yeah. it's not about status, it's the opposite, it's renunciation. Mm. But what the full ordination enables us to do is live according to the chain the Buddha laid out, and that includes developing our own monasteries and ordaining our own nuns, having leadership, having uh, autonomy to develop places that suit the female way of doing things as well, not only to be under the control of the monks, because quite frankly, that is the situation at the moment. You know, everything is there. The, the monks basically call the shots. Is that fair to say? That's yes. It's controversial, but the nuns are basically true. only novices officially, and that means they can't develop their own communities. As a fully ordained nun, we can ordain our own community members, our own bikinis, and train them from scratch. So this gives a lot more um, empowerment to women, but also um, just an ability to to do things a different way, because the same old models don't work always. We need variety, we need diversity, we need inclusivity, yes? So, I mean, one of the things I think being a bikini helps with is understanding a little bit how it feels to be marginalized, mainly around gender, but gender in religion, but I know that many people here will feel marginalized or discriminated against due to race or due to their sexuality or due to their gender identity. And I don't want to recreate that. I want a place where people can feel empowered and people can feel respected for who they are and able to flourish in the ways that feel natural to them. So there is a difference there. Um, and I think women deserve a choice. How would you feel if you could only ever be like a junior doctor, never a full-fledged doctor, an assistant teacher, never a teacher? We're missing out on the wisdom of women. The wisdom is very deep, you know? How do we even know yet? We haven't even been given a chance. So this is what we're trying to do. And I am very passionate about that. I always have been, always will be. The things which I just cannot teach. Just the wisdom, the experience of a monk, is not the same as the experience of a woman. In the time of the Buddha, they had great nuns, amazing teachers of meditation, fully enlightened. I want to make that, op that possible here in UK. This is where I was born. I feel I've not done my duty to my... in Australia? Oh, in Australia we've got it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, we've got great monasteries in Australia, fully ordained women there, but nothing in UK. So, this is not of my birth. I know many people yeah. don't want me to move, so... Yeah, okay.
say keep in touch and also look at our online programs. We have sutta discussions every Friday and metta meditation and lots of other teachings happening uh, around England. So even in Ajahn Ram's absence, <laughs> even though the we teaching goes on, there, we'll still be yeah. a lot to bring us together. So please take care, yeah. everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time.